Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kali. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kali, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kali. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cashflow Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Daniel Woodford from Mission Bay Capital Group. Welcome to the show, uh, Daniel. I appreciate your time today. Thanks, Sakar. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. Awesome. So Daniel with uh, Daniel is with uh, Mission Bay Capital Partners. Uh, their company uh, does a lot of syndications in high growth markets. Uh, he has done over 10 uh, different syndications so far, and their group currently controls uh, about 1500 doors. And he is a very active in the multifamily space, raising uh, lots of capital and doing a lot of deals. Uh, it's a very high intense dynamic group. And I'm here uh, to interview Daniel and know a lot more details and, you know, uh, understand their story. So welcome to the show, Daniel. Um, help us get started uh, as to, you know, like how, how was your background, how you kind of came about into multifamily and syndications in a big way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, great. So uh, I guess my background started, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a military person, retired military. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, about five years out from retiring, I retired in 2014. And about five years out from retiring, I decided, you know what, I need to create some sort of passive income or some sort of income to replace this, this, my, you know, my nine to five, my W2, essentially. Mm-hmm. And about five years out, I started investing in single family uh, uh, houses, so me and my partner. Uh, we were in the Pentagon and, and, you know, on nights and weekends, we would, we would be out uh, looking at properties, scoping out properties, talking to brokers and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And I would say with the first, uh, it started probably somewhere around 20, 2009 time frame, and probably the first two or three years, uh, we, we did about 30 transactions or so, whether there be uh, fixed and flips or uh, fixed and hold for rentals. And we still hold a few of those single families um, mm-hmm. or they were just wholesale deals, just straight wholesale deals. So we did about 30 transactions uh, at, at that point mm-hmm. in time and decided, um, you know, we've done, we've done about what we could do here in single family. It wasn't, uh, you know, like, like most people have, you know, come to the realization that, you know, the scalability of it is just not necessarily there. Sure. And so sure. We, we transitioned over to multifamily. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, I'd say by the end of 2013 is when we uh, first uh, started. We, we, we got our first multifamily. It was a 40 unit uh, deal mm-hmm. in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, so we're I pretty see. excited about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just three of us partners, uh, myself, my partner, and another, uh, and another uh, a limited uh, investor, limited partner investor. Mm-hmm. And we were able to take down that. It was only a $1.1 million raise. Oh, not raise, I'm sorry, $1.1 million purchase. Sure. And mm-hmm. the raise was $250,000. We did that. And then, you know, the market was in such a way that, you know, uh, within a year and a half, we were able to sell that. We made a significant profit. We did a 1031 exchange into the next property. Awesome. So that's kind of how that's kind of how we got our start, and from there we just continued. And that was our the next property was our first real syndication, and from there that was a two million dollars syndication, and then it just started blossoming from there and snowballing really from there. I see, I see. So it sounds like you also like a lot of other folks, uh, you know, started through single family, did a lot of uh, different things, whether it was buy and hold or a flip or a wholesale. Till you came to realization that I guess single family is a lot more ineffective. It's 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 a lot more uh, you know better to go into multifamily to just kind of have that sort of economies of scale as we call it and have the efficiency of dedicated property management. And that's right. Absolutely. Awesome. awesome. So how does uh, how does your group look like today in terms of you know? Uh, like how many doors you have, what sort of different states uh, you have projects in, and things like that. Yeah, so our group is is, is uh, we got basically three three partners and and one person that works for us on our staff, um, uh, Chuck Triska, um, Christine Jefferson, who leads up our capital raising arm, does a phenomenal job raising capital for us. She's raised um, you know upwards of twenty million dollars since we started our capital raising arm. Mm-hmm. And um, you know Rob Leonard, who's on, who's our ops assistant, who you know ops assistant, who 
really couldn't couldn't make this work without him. And so we got a we got a great team. We're a very small team, but we got a great team. We got about fourteen hundred, I don't know, fifteen hundred doors now, fifteen hundred mm-hmm. doors uh, in our portfolio. And Mid Atlantic is is our main uh, market. We like Richmond. We like everything. You know, I'll say everything, but we're we're Richmond and South is where we are. So Mid Atlantic, the Southeast. We've got a few uh, doors in uh, in Texas, three or four properties in Texas, and we've got one, you know, one in uh, Phoenix. You know, we like that market also. So, kind of mainly though, Mid Atlantic and Southeast. I see, I see. So pretty much high velocity, high growth markets where you know you can get the upside and things like that. So, uh, help us understand, uh, Daniel, that um, like when a offering memorandum comes to us, right? Um, how, what, what kind of things you look at it to, uh, kind of understand whether, uh, okay, is it a deal or it doesn't make any sense? Uh, give us some uh, sort of philosophy of how you go about analyzing the deals. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, what, so offering memorandum from the broker is what you're saying uh, sure, sure. To, to see it, see a deal. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the biggest thing that, that, um, that I'm looking for initially just to see if it's something that works because, you know, we're value add opportunity type investors. Sure. So we're looking for the value add. So typically there's a section in the first part of the uh, offering memorandum that talks about, you know, what are the opportunities here at this project? Mm-hmm. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll scope that out. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then another uh, sure tell indicator is, you know, we're going to look at the underwriting of the performa that the broker puts together. And of course, you know, typically, you know, I got a lot of broker friends, so, you know, they, you know they're, they're all, you know, they're all great. But, you know, so you can see how some some brokers maybe might, uh, let's say, uh, embellish um, the pro forma a little bit. Sure, and so, we, sure. you know, we, we look at those uh, those opportunities and those things to see. But it kind of gives you also an indication of, okay, uh, what's the potential value add here, hmm. right? And so that's kind of what, what you know, we'll look at. We'll look at the, the initial uh, value add. And, and then we'll look at the numbers to see, you know, is it is it really realistic in our mm-hmm. minds, particularly with the with regards to if we've got any type of capex budget that we have to put in, and that type of thing. So, I see, I see, because you know, as as I think you indicate, it might be great for our listeners to know that, I mean, many a times, you know, when you see the pro forma, you as you said, it's embellished or like literally they'll say, oh, there is a spread of hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars uh, in rent. Perhaps the vacancies are, uh, you know, the vacancy percentage could be like, you know, two, three percent sometimes. So it's really optimized to kind of uh, maybe for unsavvy buyers say that, oh, there is just so much value at potential. And all you know is that it's, it's, it's so much bloated that it's almost impossible to, uh, you know, sort of go in and then you really realize that, oh, boy, we bought this at a very high price and uh, and that sort of net margin is just not there, right? That's so, right. Uh, so speaking of a little bit details, uh, Daniel, here is um, like, what is your take on some sensitivity analysis and things like that, that uh, typically that goes with some of these underwriting? So uh, share, share with us as to like, you know, uh, what sort of metrics you look at and, you know, uh, upside downside protections and things like that in deals. Yeah. So, I mean, sensitivity analysis, uh, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, we're looking at cap rates, uh, we're looking at uh, vacancy rates. And so, you know, that's kind of what the, some of the main uh, areas are, and we're looking at rent growth. And, and so we're looking at a full picture of the entire underwriting performance to see, okay, well, what if we don't get the type of rent growth that we're looking for? <laughs> or uh, what if the exit cap is not actually uh, six and a half, it actually turns out to be seven. So we're kind of uh, adjusting all the various different factors that can impact your return number and then we go from there uh, and then the other piece of it is that we try to be uh, we try to be conservative with our one of the biggest pieces of, that we like to be is conservative with our uh, operational reserves because a lot of operators uh, kind of uh, kind of gloss over that number and maybe you know have such a, have a small number in there for their operational reserve we like as large of an operational reserve as we can get mm-hmm. to get our numbers to work because you know, we just, you know, that's, that, that, you know, we just like to sleep at night. So that's, that helps us to ensure that a, we can cover any, um, what, ha- you know, anything that happens out of the property mm-hmm. and B, uh, you know, it ensures that or mitigates our having to go out for any type of capital call in, in, in that matter. So, uh, so we're looking at, uh, you know, adjusting all of the various different factors in our performer to see what the sensitivity truly is. And we're, we're adjusting here and there as we see fit. 
I see, I see. And, and on a, just on a related topic, uh, Daniel, uh, some of the states or the submarkets that you invest, right? What sort of factors you are tracking on perhaps a monthly basis or, you know, what sort of uh, data you're uh, looking at for, uh, you know, sort of the next opportunities to invest? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, the major factors and, and you know, I think most uh, most operators are, are, are this way and they're looking at a lot of the major factors like, you know, the biggest, the big, biggest couple are, are job growth. You know what's coming in, what's happening, who's 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 moving in, who's there, who's staying, uh, and then population growth, growth, who's you know who's moving into the area and so forth. So those are the two biggest things. We're, we're looking at median income, we're looking at crime, um, and so we're, we're we're we've got several different uh, metrics that we're looking at. We're talking to economic development offices to see, okay, what's the what's the plan go, moving forward? You know, the mm -hmm. one, three, five year plan and that type of thing. And so those are, those are the type of things we do when we go in to study a market. I see, I see. And, and uh, Daniel, are you typically buying uh, mostly stabilized properties, uh, like maybe occupancy, uh, you know, 90% and up, uh, that kind of thing? Or are you doing any sort of distress uh, value add type of uh, repositioning uh, type of projects? So what, what is sort of your acquisition strategy? Yeah, so we're we're typically you know we're 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 stabilized. We're typically looking at stabilized, but we'll go a little bit lower than ninety percent. We've gone as low as you know you know eighty two to eighty five percent. You know if we can call that you know semi stabilized, I guess. But sure. Mm -hmm. But we're we're looking for uh, you know some some relatively decent cash flow going into the deal. Sure. And then we're looking at a business plan that's very ex executable by year one to ensure that we can get to the cash flow that we need to ensure mm -hmm. that our, our investors are paid. And so, yeah, so we're not, we're not, we're not too risky with regards to uh, finding something that's 75% or 70 or, or, or just distress like that. Sure. Um, we, mm -hmm. we, we like to ensure that we have the cash flow, uh, you know, starting relatively day one for our investors. I see. I see. Now uh, on a, on a related topic, uh, Daniel, like when you're doing the value add projects or when you like uh, sort of take on the asset, right. Um, are you like placing like a third party property management, uh, you know, walk us through some of the management and renovation uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, details as to how you start and you know, how you sort of reposition these things. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so it starts really with the, with the cap, honing in on the CapEx budget. We, I mean, obviously we've done it, uh, you know, a number of times, so we kind of got a good feel of what things cost. Mm -hmm. But honing in on the CapEx budget, and then, you know, when we hire, a, when we hire our property manager, we like to hire, um, you know, we, we, we still hire third-party property management. We don't do mm -hmm. property management in-house. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're, we're looking for somebody that has that type of experience that's done this before, I mean, more mm -hmm. than one time type of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of our, our, our managers have, you know, four or 5,000 doors under management and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they, they're they either in the middle of a renovation like like we're doing or, or, or you know, have, have done several in the past. And so that's kind of what we're looking for uh, with regards to, to that. Now, when we look at our property manager, we're hiring a property manager. We also look at, you know, well, what type of software do they use? I mean, is it is it a truly a multifamily software? That's a key indicator for, for us is if it's, if, if if they're not typically using, you know, one of the more established software pro uh, uh, programs and, you know, are they truly, you know, are they truly institutional with their management? Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll look at, we'll look at that. We'll look at the type of reporting that they give to us, um, you know, or, or to a client on a monthly basis and how often that type of thing, you know, we'll make sure that our reporting, because when it, well, at the end of the day, we've got to report to investors and um, you know, and, and we've got to have we've got to have those numbers on time every month to ensure that we can you know analyze, asset manage, and get those get those numbers to investors. And so that's you know it's really key for the property manager. That that's the key piece. Right, right. Awesome, awesome. Thank, thank you for that detail. Uh, on a related topic now, uh, Daniel, uh, when you're vetting the property managers, right, uh, they are, I mean, basically, they are pretty much eyes and ears of our property and the performance uh, moving forward and things like that, right? Um, uh, where I'm going with this question, Daniel, is that when the renovations are going on, right, um, how do you sort of uh, vet all the details as far as controlling costs or, you know, what sort of uh, amenity packages they are putting in and things like that. So who manages all that detail? Do you, are you, is your group sort of has a standardized uh, system or plan of uh, a skew of materials that you are giving? Uh, walk us some of that sort of the detail uh, on, on the ground type of uh, details there. 
Yeah, so so um, we we manage it in, uh, for a large a large part of it, but we also in, on times we have a, a large project, we'll bring in a, a you know a construction management person mm-hmm. that, that basically works for us and is overseeing essentially what the property manager is doing on site mm-hmm. and is involved with the day to day. You know, we like to be involved on a day to day, but you know, a lot of these larger projects uh, get time consuming, so. In that regard, we'll have a we'll, we'll have a construction management person that we that we bring on that we that, that helps us on, on the day to day with regards to that. So they're very experienced with regards to project management and and costs and that type of thing. And, hmm. and I don't think we've had a, a project that's gone over uh, over budget at this point. So we're we're knock on wood. So we're yeah. sure sure. And and that speaks in terms of you know how greatly you're managing these projects and just the general asset management piece of it, right? Uh, so on that uh, on that uh, sort of related note, uh, Daniel, um, how are you sort of um, managing the asset management piece of it? Meaning, like you know, what sort of uh, reports or meetings or weekly uh, sort of indicators you are charting uh, when you are like sort of on your weekly calls with your property managers and things like that. What, what Walk us through some of that detail, like how, how that goes and what sort of questions or reports you're looking at. Yeah, in many regards, we get a, a weekly report and some 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 property managers, uh, we, 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 we stick to a, we're, we're able to stick to a monthly report because um, we, um, you know, I'm, I'm typically in constant contact with them anyway. But uh, we typically when we get our weekly reports from our, our property managers, we're looking at, you know, occupancy rates, traffic. Um, we're looking at uh, you know the com- what's com- been completed with regards to capex. What are the challenges that are happening out there? Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, do we need to change our marketing strategy to to get additional traffic in? Um, you know those types of things that, that, that we're looking at. So we get we get a report with regards to that every week, mm-hmm. and uh, and then monthly we obviously get the the property management report. Where we're on the line with our property manager, kind of discussing you know the overall trends of what's happened that month. We're going over variance reports to see where we are with regards to our, you know, with regards to our budget and, um, and, and, and just to make sure that we're on track to hit, where, you know, the targets that we need to hit. Particularly, you know, uh, when you're first starting, obviously you're trying to hit a refinance to so maybe at year two or year three, making sure that your, your projections are on target to get to the, the, the right uh, refinance number that you've promised investors and that type of thing. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I see, I see. And, and walk us through some of uh, like, like, you know, for example, now we are in a uh, sort of a COVID environment, right? I mean, a lot of uh, competitors are perhaps uh, trying to, you know, preserve the occupancy or increase the occupancy per se, right? There may be some concessions or uh, some uh, type of, uh, you know, things that are giveaways, right? So, some of that those things happen on let's say like let's say if you are uh, in virginia but you have an asset in let's say richmond or let's say tennessee or the texas of the world or the georgia right um, walk us through like how you manage the, sort of that detail that uh, you know some of the incentives that perhaps your competitors may be giving right and it's almost like you have to micromanage some of that detail, uh, you know, along with your property manager. Uh, and, and the reason I'm asking that question is that specifically now, as we know, uh, due to COVID, there has been so much turbulence that, uh, you know, everyone is trying to sort of uh, increase their occupancy. And, and tell, us, tell us about, you know, what, what are your sort of thinking and philosophy beyond some, some of these topics? Yeah, so our main goal, uh, uh, you know, in this environment right now is 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 not to not uh, you know keep the occupancy where we are, not to let it drop at all, if at all possible. So, um, we'll, we'll one of the main incentives that we're giving right now is okay, if you if you pay your rent on time, then we'll give you a, you know a small concession. It's typically you know what we're doing is about twenty five dollar concession, and we found that on a lot of our properties that we're doing that. In fact, one of our properties we're collecting over a hundred percent rents at. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. which is great. I mean, we're given a $25 concession to those that are on time, mm-hmm. but at the same time, we've got a hundred percent rent. So we're, I, I, I mean, that, it pays the bills, it keeps the property going and make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're a stable property. And in fact, on that property, we're still paying, we're still paying uh, prep returns to our investors where mm-hmm. a lot of properties, you've, uh, a lot of properties have suspended their returns. So we found sure. that, you know, 
tracking that really closely will uh, helps us enable to on some of our properties to continue prepare, uh, paying our prep returns to investors even. Mm -hmm. Now, since you brought up the subject of uh, returns, uh, Daniel, uh, kindly share as to, uh, you know, how you structure deals uh, uh, along with your passive investors and things like that. Yeah. So what typically do uh, a 70-30 split or some sort of split of the, uh, of the asset and where the general partnership is 30% on investors hold a majority of the, of the uh, asset at 70%. And then we'll do a 7% we'll seven, we'll preferred. You know, mm -hmm. typically, you know, we've done between, typically we've done between seven, eight percent preferred, depending on what we can, you know, we, we can muster on, on a, any given deal. And we try mm -hmm. to push that as, you know, as high as we can, mm -hmm. uh, just to make it as appealing because a lot, again, we're, we're, we're investing for cash flow, so we, and we, and our investors like the cash flow, uh, so we're, we're trying sure. to appease that. And so that's kind of how we structure it. And then, and then there might be some sort of promote on the back end, maybe if we hit a certain hurdle. You know, if we hit a certain IRR or an average annual return, then maybe the distributions will go to 50-50, you know, that type of thing. It just depends on what the deal can support. Sure, sure, sure. Very, very good, very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that detail. Uh, and also, Daniel, speaking of investors, you know, like equity raising and appealing the uh, sort of the uh, asset or the deal to the uh, passive investors is a huge part of, uh, you know, sort of the job that we do on a continual basis, right? Uh, can you share with us, Daniel, as to, you know, what sort of activities your group is doing uh, to, you know, attract more passive investors and attract more more capital in general. Yeah, I mean, we're doing a lot of uh, networking right now, um, and we're doing, you know, uh, a lot of um, social media type stuff. And Christine really handles a lot of that uh, for mm -hmm. our group. Um, and so um, you may want to have her on at some point, but she does a lot of that for our group. And so we, it, again, it's a lot of a lot of networking on on our side, and um, and that type of thing is, is what we're working on right now. I see. I see. And um, I know a lot of operators, uh, you know, implement a lot of different portals or some other uh, tools. Uh, how is your sort of investor management portion? Uh, uh, how, how do you sort of track the communication or perhaps the sort of the capital uh, raise portion of things like that? How, how does that look like within your group? Yeah, we also have an online portal. I think, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's a must have in, uh, nowadays, you know, sure. online portal. <laughs> Just makes things much easier for investors. You know, they do everything electronically. We can on, on the back end, we can track uh, where the investors are through the entire process from the time that they, you know, review the documents, review the opportunity, sign the documents, wire their funds, and that type of thing. So we're mm -hmm. tracking it, and our tool allows us to track it. Uh, we use IDR, allows mm -hmm. us to track it all the way through. Uh, I like that. So. I see. I see. And, and Daniel, what what are sort of your goals for next three years, five years? Uh, where, where do you see Mission Bay Capital Group uh, heading uh, uh, in the next few years? In the next few years, um, I, I typically don't put, a, you know, we, we kind of get to when we get together as a, as a group, we don't typically put a number uh, of units or doors uh, per mm -hmm. se on, on what we want to do. But we, what we really look at is a capability that we want to that we want to bring to the to the to the market space and that is sure. capability to be able to, to be able to fund a, a given number of deals mm -hmm. um, per quarter or per year, per year and so that's what we're really focusing on right now is the capital raise aspect mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. of our company mm -hmm. uh, to be able to have a capability to fund you know three or four deals a quarter type of thing so that's kind of what we're looking at I see. I see. Now, given the COVID pandemic that has happened, uh, Daniel, do you expect uh, like prices to drop or stay flat? Uh, what is sort of your take on the market in the sort of the short term, uh, like let's say next three to six months of sorts? It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, and, and we're kind of in a wait and see mode. So Carl, we really are, uh, to be quite honest. Um, you know, we're not really executing on many deals right now. And, and a lot of it is because we're saying that there's really not a, a significant movement, mm -hmm. a downward movement in the pricing of these, of these, of these deals. We're just not seeing it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we're thinking that, you know, the market may be, you know, obviously, you know, like most of the thing, the market might, might be stabilized a little bit with all the, you know, government assistance and that type of thing. But uh, we're, we're tracking to see and we're wondering to see, well, what happens when that actually runs out in next, you know, potentially in the next couple of months or, or whenever it does run out, you know, what happens then? So I think that if there's something like that that's going to happen, you know, with some sort of price adjustments, you know, downward price adjustments, it's probably going to happen, you know, towards the end of the year. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, you just never can tell. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens when we get there.
Right, right. And on your existing projects, Daniel, have you uh, continued with the renovations or have you like sort of uh, stopped any of the sort of the CapEx uh, or value add projects that may be ongoing? So for the projects that we actually have renovation dollars in escrow, we've mm. continued. Uh, mm. And one of the reasons is because we're finding that, you know, construction costs are, are have, have crept down a little bit. So we, we're taking advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, anything that requires any type of um, capex out of our uh, owner uh, reserve account, we're not we're not doing. Uh, everything that's already in an escrow account is already reserved for for some sort of renovation that you know we we we're we're still going moderately with. You know we're still executing parts of the business plan that we feel are necessary to continue it moving forward as we come out of this pandemic. Sure, sure, sure. And I want to share with you, uh, with our listeners that your group just closed on a uh, 156 unit deal uh, at uh, in uh, late March, and that was pretty much through the pandemic. Uh, share, share with, uh, uh, give, give us some details, Daniels, on that, how that, how that went down. Yeah, it, it really got a little hairy there. I mean, because, you know, like you said, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. I mean, we're, we're coming into uh, first part of March and then mid-March. I think mid-March is what, when everything started to, you shut know, was like on a Monday, everything started to shut down. And my lender, I mean, it seemed like an eternity from that Monday to Friday to understand what was going to happen to our deal because we didn't know if they were going to pull our loan or what they were going to do. So on a Monday, we get a call from our lender that says, okay, your loan looks like it's still going through. It looks, it looks okay. Um, and, and you might have to bring an interest reserve. I said, okay, well, you know, what, what might that be? Well, it might be a month or two. Mm -hmm. Wednesday, we get another call that says, oh man, every, every mm -hmm. time I get a call from the higher ups in the, in the, in the, in the group here, I think that the, you know, they, they think that the deal's going to get, you know, axed. You know, they think, <laughs> they think that he said, Daniel, I said, listen, every time I get a call from the, you know, the, the, the asset management guys or whoever's processing the deal, they're like, I think it, I think they're calling me to ax the deal, but it didn't get axed. <laughs> and he's saying, saying, well, now it might be three or four months of uh, uh, operational res of, of interest reserve. Ouch! <laughs> <laughs> and then by Friday, it was like, listen, Daniel, the only way to get this deal done is you got to bring a, a one year to the table and, and interest. Oh, reserve. like <laughs> <laughs> we had to bring. We were scrambling at that point, but we still got it to close. Sure, yeah. sure. So, did that mean, Daniel, that uh, you had to maybe reach out to the investors again, or you had some more operational reserves already budgeted within that you kind of moved to the lender escrow at that point. Yeah. So, so this was, the, this is kind of leaning back to what I was talking about uh, with regards to programming in a significant amount of ops reserves in your sure. budget. Mm -hmm. We had $600,000 programmed into our ops reserve. So we had to take 500,000 of that and put it into the interest reserve. Right, so luckily, right, right, you know. So luckily, we were able to we were able to do that. And uh, I know, I know. Sometimes you don't you don't see that coming, but when something yeah. like this happens, it's like thank goodness we had that cushion so that we could you know yeah. just sort of divert. Well, very well done, very well done. Now, Daniel, I know that you network with a lot of passive investors, right? Um, you know, what sort of, uh, you know, advertising or sort of promotions uh, or, uh, you know, sort of the benefits of multifamily, uh, how are you sort of interfacing with them? Like, let's say you go on and meet an investor, uh, you know, let's say at a coffee or a bar or what have you, right? Uh, how does that conversation go down? Like, how, how you sort of explain them the benefit? Give, give us some of that uh, sort of uh, tell tape as to, you know, how, how you sort of uh, tell them the benefits. So, Sakar, can I can I be absolutely honest with regards to sure. the passive investors? Absolutely. If I meet some, if I meet somebody, I, I pass them on to Christine. Is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> she's the expert. I, I'm going to tell you, she's the expert. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 a process, you know, just like any other process of getting to sure. know uh, your investor, you know, uh -huh. getting them to you know know like and trust you, as they say in the industry. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And um, you know that that that's a process, and it takes a little bit of time, but um, you know, we find that. Um, we're able to, you know, get a number in, you know, on a, on a, on a regular basis. So it's keeping us, keeping us moving forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think uh, it, it might be uh, sort of, uh, I have to get Christine on the show because uh, her name keeps popping up and she's so central. It seems that I have to get her on the show now, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good. Uh, thank you, Daniel. So kind of sh share with us, uh, uh, Daniel, that 
Um, I know you had such a long career so far. Um, give us some sense of some best advice or some habits that you are currently adopt uh, or rather, you know, you do on a daily basis. Uh, that kind of keeps you disciplined as you're sort of doing the activities daily or you're looking at deals and things like that. Uh, give us some sort of best pieces of advice that you have received so far. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is a relationship base, um, you know, it's, and then with regards to analyzing deals, you've got to have criteria in place to ensure that you're just not chasing every, every deal for mm -hmm. us. And so we, we like to make sure that we have the, the proper criteria in place to, and to ensure that we're hitting the numbers that we need to hit. I mean, we've done it a number of times and we want to make sure that we hit the numbers that we need to hit with regards mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. investor returns. Um, I think that's kind of uh, uh, where we are. I see. I see. Good. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it is a pleasure to, you know, have you on the podcast. I know you are a wealth of knowledge and, uh, you know, you're always willing to share. Uh, you know, obviously we have met in a few conferences, um, uh, you know, so far, and it's always a pleasure to interact with you. So thank you for your you time too. today. I, I greatly appreciate it. All right, Sakar. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thanks for listening to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates, research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest.